Hi guys, welcome back to uh, another web episode. Uh, this is another episode of Nephrology Storytelling. Before I kick off this one, I want to let you guys know that very next month, coming up in March, will be Neph Madness hosted on the AJKD blog. It's going to be a really exciting year with lots of uh, incredible matchups, great learning, hopefully lots of discussion. So please be sure to check that out if you're a fellow, make a bracket, there's some prizes involved. Uh, most of all, have fun and uh, learn something. So um, this episode is continuation of the last where I kind of tell some of the great stories of nephrology. And in this one, I want to talk about the kidney biopsy. I'm going to be playing some music gently in the background for a purpose. So, so if you guys recognize this tune, there's a purpose to it. So. Um, as you know from my path videos, this is something that's particularly near and dear to my heart and I want to spend some time on it. I'm going to make a separate video paired with this one where I actually demonstrate some of the needles. Be sure to check that one out as well. You might recognize this tune in the back, which is the needle and the damage done. Uh, a Neil Young tune from his seminal 1972 album Harvest. The reference is obviously at this point to IV drug use and how it can derail your life, but track 9 is the needle and the damage done. Uh, there really aren't very many opportunities for me to merge my love of music with nephrology. Uh, this editorial from my former attending Bill Whittier at Rush is one of those moments. So the history of the kidney biopsy, other than autopsy specimens, dates back to around the turn of the 20th century. There are two physicians that published work on this and both were similar with regards to doing open, what they called nephropexies, where they would fixate the kidney in an attempt to relieve Bright's disease, which is now an obsolete term that referred to chronic interstitial nephritis or end-stage kidneys. Interestingly, in these surgeries, the goal was actually relief of inflammation by decapsulating the kidney and puncturing it multiple times. The papers are quite descriptive, stating things like, we would cut down and attack the organs. Or this quote, I explo explored the kidney uh, suspected of containing a stone in a young man, 24 years of age, suffering from renal colic. There was blood in the urine and the kidney was very tender on pressure. The exploration consisted in exposing the organ and passing a darning needle, blunt end foremost, through it in many directions. No stone was found, but temporary relief from pain and hemorrhage was given. However, within a year, he returned to see me. Bright's disease became more and more marked, and four years afterwards, he died of parenchymatous nephritis. In any case, open biopsies at this point were also being taken, most of which were just revealing chronic interstitial nephritis. The other thing that was quite interesting to note from the same paper in 1903 was that there were already egos in medicine and publications were already getting scooped. And as you can see here, Dr. Ferguson stated in an editorial, when a certain man does certain work and publishes it, not in an obscure medical journal, but in JAMA on a certain date, and another man does certain work along the same line and publishes the result of his labors one month and 11 days afterward, it would seem that the first author should be the one entitled to first credit, but that does not matter very much. So that was at around the turn of the, uh, the century. By mid-1940s, kidney cortex was actually being taken from open s surgeries called sympath sympathectomies, uh, which is an open procedure with the intent of vasodilating the vasculature and lowering blood pressure. One of the fathers of renal pathology, pictured here, Robert Heptonstall, he published some of the very first descriptions of this time of the vascular changes in response to hypertension. And you most likely recognize his name as the author of the first and definitive nephro nephropathology textbook. The first description of percutaneous kidney biopsy came out of Denmark, two physicians by the name of Iverson and Brunn. This was really a novel idea, and from their initial 1951 publication, they state, I quote, aspiration biopsy of tumor tissue is a classical procedure for examination of the nature of neoplastic disease, but this method has not been applied extensively to diseases of the parenchymatous organ. 
Aspiration was already quite useful at this time for hepatic disorders, but had not yet been applied to renal tissue. These physicians uh, positioned patients in the sitting position and performed the biopsy only with anatomic landmarks. They used a serrated needle to cut the incision and then applied suction to aspirate tissue. As you might expect with this procedure, they had some issues with yield and only about half of the patients that underwent it had sufficient tissue for diagnosis. The percutaneous procedure as we know it today was really defined by two doctors in Chicago at Presbyterian Hospital, Drs. Kark on the left here and Dr. Murky on the right. Robert Kark was born in South Africa. He received his medical education at Guy's Hospital in London and then started work in the States in Boston in the late 1930s, initially working on what would soon to be discovered as vitamin K. When World War II broke out, he joined the Air Force, and in this capacity, he not only foiled a sabotage attack on Winston Churchill, but also invented the single-pane aviator's goggle. He eventually rose to be chief medical officer for the British Canadian Army. After the war, he moved to Chicago and started working on kidney biopsies with a young medical student pictured on the right, Robert Murky, and they developed a method of obtaining kidney cores rather than tissue aspiration. In their first publication in 1954, they had successfully performed 50 biopsies, with 48 of them yielding sufficient diagnostic tissue. Amazingly, the histologic diagnosis altered the treatment plan in about a quarter of the patients. By the following year, they published their work of the first 200 biopsies in annals with remarkably low complication rates using a Franklin-modified Vim Silverman needle. The other major alteration that Kark and Murky altered from the earlier description is to place patients in the prone rather than the sitting position and to observe the hub of the needle sway in an arc with inspiration and expiration if it was placed to the depth of the kidney capsule. A schematic of the needle itself, two parts, a larger bore outer cannula, and then an internal needle which obtains a core and splits into two to retrieve the tissue. I've uh, created another video where I actually demonstrate this needle, so be sure to check that out. Here's what the needle looks like in real life. In the top picture, you have both the outer cannula and the inner core together, and in the bottom picture, you have them separate. The internal needle still has a hollow bore to punch the kidney sample and then splits into two without disrupting it. In Kark's own words, the tissue is, quote, punched and bitten from the kidney with this technique. Soon after, a manual needle was introduced with some slight modifications. The needle no longer split into two, but the inner cutting edge had a shelf where the core would rest and then an outer cutting sheath would protrude over it to keep it in place as the needle was retracted. This is the same cutting edge as we have today with spring-loaded devices, and this schematic nicely shows how it works. The core that is taken can be confirmed immediately to tell that it is kidney tissue, and if you look very closely at your next kidney biopsy, hold it up to the light and see if you can notice small red dots, which are glomeruli. This view that is shown here would only be seen under a dissecting microscope, but you can actually see glomeruli with the naked eye. The last big modification to the procedure was to create spring-loaded devices where the cutting edge is automated when you press a trigger. Some people call these devices biopsy guns, and there are a wide range of commercial devices available, depending on your institution. So to close, I want to focus on these two giants here. As already discussed on the left, Dr. Robert Kark is the father of the percutaneous kidney biopsy as we know it today and in many ways shaped the field of nephrology. But let's not forget that nephropathology prior to this point was essentially an examination of end-stage kidneys and autopsy specimens. When Kark took these samples, someone needed to look at them histologically, and that person is pictured on the right, Dr. Conrad Pirani. Pirani was a pathology resident who had done some work during the war on preservation of renal function using IV solutions and shock, and when Kark started taking these biopsies, there was considerable skepticism amongst pathologists. The chairman of the department at that time put his most junior faculty on this task, saying, quote, try to make some sense of these small specimens. 
Pirani's work during this time set the stage of nephropathology as we know it. He meticulously developed a semi-quantitative scoring system for every compartment of the kidney, graded it, its chronicity and activity, and defined dozens of diseases as we know them today. Pirani went on to become chairman of pathology at Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago before moving to chair of pathology at Columbia. He there worked with a very young Jerry Appel to define the very first WHO classification of lupus and essentially transformed nephropathology from an autopsy-based field to a biopsy-based one. So with that, I'm going to end this video. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this. Check out the other video that I'm going to post where I demonstrate the different kidney biopsy needles in real life, and I'll see you guys next month.